now that we're familiar with your story a little mm -hmm. bit more to go back in. And what I want to do is kind of go back to the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. And you can't really, you can't even start there. You've got to know why it is that Mao believes that it's so important to return and to sort of purify the Communist Party and purify the culture because it seems to be doing things against what his uh, original ideas are. And in order for you to know that, you have to go back and see, well, what is it that happened before the Cultural right. Revolution? And you right. kind of have to go back to the beginning of where in the world is Mao getting his ideas in the first place? Right. And I think it's important to see that early on, you know, the early 19th, 20th century saw China transition from its multi-centuries old tradition of, of different uh, empires holding right. control over the country mm -hmm. to having a, a revolution where there's a nationalist movement that's trying to adopt some Western conceptions of government into the nation. A lot of warring factions happen. You have, you know, the, the nation under Chiang Kai-shek, I think, was the guy that really did a, a great deal of that. Mm. And you've got these nationalists and communists who at the same time are vying for power. And there's a great civil war that happens. Right. It's interrupted a little bit as Japan invades China mm. and the communists who had been marginalized but were still kind of engaged with the nationalists did decide to unify so that they can confront Japan's invasion in the context of World War II. Mm. And, you know, they're drawn into World War II. The U.S. ends up facilitating the surrender of Japan by employing the, the, uh, the nuclear weapons that they did and that then leaves China to contend now with these factions that were cooperating against Japan at that time. But now the communists are looking for power. The nationalists are looking for power and the, the communists end up victorious. Right. And the nationalist government is pushed out into Taiwan. They had been receiving a great deal of help from the U.S. and other Western allies. And there were problems with corruption. There were problems with um, them basically mis misappropriating and misusing those resources. And so the, all of that corruption played into the communists taking power, saying, we're going to reform, We're going. everything's right. going to be great. And so Mao Zedong, 1949, takes power. And one of the first things that he does is a trip to Moscow so that he can unite with his friends in the area. His entire ideology that he and the communists have was shaped on Marxist ideals. Now, just as in Russia, Lenin adapted the political philosophy of Marxism and all of its implications into economics and everything else to the Russian culture. In China, Mao did the same thing. He took Marxist ideas, he took the lessons of Lenin and Stalin and adapted them to Chinese culture. Right. So it had its own unique spin, its own unique signature that was marked by the way that the Chinese understand these ideas. And Mao was a master of integrating those two things so that the Chinese people would accept those ideas right. in, uh, in a way that made sense to them. Whereas if he tried to simply translate by rote Leninist Marxism, right, right, right. China, it wouldn't really, it wouldn't mesh as much, mm -hmm. but, but Mao was able to brilliantly make this work so that people accepted it. They had already been burned by the nationalists. And right. so he came to power and they did that. Now, I think it's important early on. We, I have clipped certain parts of various documentaries that I really focus on these things. And I want to bring a clip into play now. In the winter of 1949, Mao arrived for his first official visit in Moscow. The Chinese Peasants' Revolution had been eyed with suspicion by the Russians, who used agents to try to bring their influence to bear. In particular, they did not shy from criticism of the Chinese regime. Relations between the Communist Party led by Mao and the Soviet Union led by Stalin were under strain. Mao sought financial and economic aid. However, he would never allow Moscow to assume the leadership role nor would he accept the role of a junior partner or even satellite state. From the outset, the relationship was marked by rivalry. Okay, so there, there's a transition there that I want to make sure that we talk about a little bit. So in 1949, we have Mao very much uh, aligned with Stalin, who he saw as his counterpart in Russia. Uh, there is one thing that a uh, few Americans are aware of because the, the Chinese Communist Party under Mao, they were very... Uh, smart, very strategic. Basically, they told the West that 
they are not going to do a Soviet style communism. They are actually going to do something like America's uh, democracy. And they have a lot of people in the U.S. government who are sympathetic to them. There is a very famous biography uh, was written by Edgar Snow. I don't know if you know that person. Uh, uh, very famous book. Uh, it's called Red Star Arise in China, something like that. Okay. Yeah. And, and people like him and other journalists basically sold to the American uh, public that the Chinese Communist Party is not like the, the Soviet. Because by that time, people know how bad communism mm. was in the Soviet, right? And so they actually portray themselves as someone are uh, more modest and they are trying mm -hmm. to really build a coalition. I mean, at the first day, they, they, they pretend to do that. They are trying to be, you know, just have, uh, have a democracy. So that's, I think it's worth talking now. When we look back on history now, we already have a, an established knowledge base of some of the atrocities that happened under these various different communist regimes. Right. But while they were happening in the moment, the world did not have that information because the governments in power used propaganda not only to their own people, but to the world itself. And so they claimed that they were going to collectivize these farms and collectivize their entire agricultural and industrial systems. And that was going to produce so much. And people on the outside that agreed with these ideals very much bought into that and they wanted them to succeed. Right. And that's where in Russia, you know, the way that they ended up, there's something if you just Google Holodomor, then yeah. there was a, a great famine that was the result of these collectivizations that had to be implemented by force right. that ended up, you know, starving out huge segments of their population. But they hid the reality of that from the world. And U.S. journalists were complicit in oh, yeah. hiding of it. Right. The, actually, there is uh, one journalist, uh, I think it's the New York Times, the Moscow Bureau. Durante? Uh, Station chief. So he basically, he lied for the for Stalin. He told that what's happening in Ukraine is just being exaggerated. He said that he actually went there. I mean, he did investigation, nothing like that. And so he, he actually wrote a lot of articles and, and for that, he actually got a police award. There's a fantastic movie called Mr. Jones that you can look where there's an independent journalist that makes his way into Russia, manages to get on a train that's going to this part of the Ukraine where they were having mass starvations. Mm -hmm. These that people are so hungry and starved that they're resorting to cannibalism. Right. And he comes out and he writes a report to it, but he is then demonized by the widespread press. And again, right. These are all intellectuals in America, many of whom want socialism to succeed because they right. see socialism as the correct political ideology for the world. Right. And so that concept where your ideology starts to shape how you act uh, is very much taken taking hold of the people who want communism and socialism to right. succeed in the West and affecting how they engage in journalism. Right. And so that, I think that's important to keep in mind when you look at this history. And we talk about like uh, when the nationalists during the civil war, and if the American government wanted to support Chiang Kai-shi, then Chiang Kai-shi could still stay in power, won't lose that badly. I mean, it's cooperative government, mm -hmm. definitely, but it's kind of like a Vietnam war is that the American public didn't want to get involved. Hmm. You know what I mean? Because they saw a lot of bad things about the nationalist government, but they haven't heard any bad things about the Chinese Communist Party. And that's at a time where we haven't yet learned of the atrocities of Stalinist Russia. Yeah. Right. And they've heard about the corruption of the nationalists, and they just assume, well, the, the communists are coming in, and they're going to have the same success in China that uh, Stalin has had in Russia. Uh, yeah. And and this then now brings us to this next chapter where Mao has really modeled a lot of his activities. Uh, there's one documentary that mentions that Stalin in his communications with Mao says, you know, you really should not collectivize the farms. And he, he's alluding to the fact that they had just a disastrous output. But Mao says, no, no, we are deaf. That is absolutely going to be that because that is consistent with my communist vision. And so we see the, we'll see the result of that in a little bit. But before we do, we need to confront what Mao saw as Stalin died and Nikita Khrushchev took over in Russia. Because if you just Google uh, the secret speech of Nikita Khrushchev, one of the things that happened early on in, in his reign in Russia was that he held a meeting with the highest party leaders and he denounced 
Stalin and all of the very violent, aggressive, authoritarian things that Stalin did and basically laid a lot of the blame for all of the chaos, all of the death, all the destruction that was happening on that. And he started to reverse a lot of those policies. And it was a concept that then came to be understood as Thermidor, which was a reference to the French Revolution, Mm. where when you engage in revolution to overturn the political landscape, ideologically speaking, and you're moving to socialize and collectivize everything, and then it's not working. And then people say, well, maybe we should return to some of those market forces, return to some of the things that we had before. You start to weaken the ideological fervor that drove your revolution. And it was described as Thermidor because uh, 11 months into the French Revolution that happened. But people in, you know, acting in Russia Revolution, writing and talking about it said, this is this phenomenon of backtracking and resorting back to those old bourgeoisie or capitalist ways is something we need to to watch for. Mao would have seen what happened with Khrushchev denouncing Stalin and saying, well, this is now, you know, Khrushchev was kind of Stalin's right hand man. And now he turned on him. He betrayed his legacy and he started to backtrack on some of these ideals. I don't want that to happen to me in China. And so that is something that perhaps cost him a little bit of uh, anxiety. Now, there was a movement that happened in Russia where people started to really push back violently against the authoritarian regime, the communists there. There was a period of time where historians say that Mao saw that people's inability to criticize the government led to them having these violent actions. And so he thought, well, what we can do is we can normalize a certain level of criticism of the government so that people can get their frustrations out and that will make them more compliant. And so in this period of time in China, there were wave after wave of political campaigns. That would be slogans, propaganda, posters saying, okay, this is the government program we're going to do now. Mm -hmm. This is some new thing. And one of them that left, a, I think, a significant footprint in the mind of people who lived through it was the 100 Flowers campaign. now, the 100 Flowers campaign was where that hard line where you don't say anything bad about the government. If you do, you're going to be subject to imprisonment or retaliation. That was softened. And Mao's quote is that we actually want 100 flowers of different ideas to bloom. Let's make it OK for you to criticize the policies because maybe we'll find better policies. So 100 flowers to bloom, 100 ideas to contend. Right. And then people in the universities and in communities felt that it was safe for a little bit to to raise criticisms mm-hmm. of the party. And historians have said, well, this was an idea that was going to maybe open up the society a little bit and allow it to improve. But things didn't quite turn out that way. In 1956, the people of Hungary applied that aphorism in a way Mao hadn't expected. That spring, the new Russian leaders had denounced Stalin as a cruel and paranoid dictator. In Budapest, Stalin's statue was smashed. Intellectuals and students led the population in revolt. To Mao, the Russians had only themselves to blame. Their revisionism was responsible. In August, Moscow sent in tanks. Mao approved, but the uprising started him thinking about ways to prevent anything similar ever happening in China. In the spring of 1957, he launched a new political campaign, radically different from anything attempted in a communist state before. Mao's idea is to offer a safety valve for popular frustration by letting people criticize openly abuses by party officials. They take him at his word. Student leaders like Lin Xilin argue that the problem is not the officials, it's the communist system itself. That causes uproar. One 
，呃，他就说，如果你要上街的话，我一枪把你打死。<笑>格佩奇 ，a politics lecturer in Beijing, is vilified as an example of the treachery of the party's critics. Half a million so-called rightist intellectuals are sent to work as peasants in the countryside, where they will remain for the next twenty years. But if you look back, that was what the Mao promised to the to the intellectuals. He, he actually, the first government he set up, there are a lot of like ministry level of、uh, people who are not communists, because he promised、mm. that he promised, okay, we'll be a lot more. Democratic, we won't be like the、uh, Jiang Kaixi. Jiang Kaixi basically was a dictator. I mean,、uh -huh. I mean, he was. So he said we can do better. Our our Chinese、uh, Communist Party can do better. So they promised a democratic government. And so when he said a hundred flowers to bloom, and the Chinese intellectuals kind of just took his word for it and said, okay, if you promise this, then let's just have right. Let's have a A, a, a democracy,、yeah. but of course, things turned out very bloody and very tragic. Yeah, my understanding is that yeah, intellectuals started to say, okay, not only are we are going to criticize how policies are implemented, we're actually going to criticize the very foundation of Mao Zedong thought, the very concept of Marxism and socialism and communism. We're going to criticize the the legitimacy of that at its core, right? And Not only that, but very vocally and directly criticized Mao. Right. And as soon as that was breached, then that policy of openness was reversed, and then everybody who essentially gave the state evidence to convict them and crack down on them by giving their opinion was subject to retaliation. Right. And that was after the Communist Party shut down the church. The first thing they did is to shut down the churches and to control whatever, control the leadership, the, the pastors and all that. And at that time, most Chinese intellectuals are okay with it because most of them are、uh, were not Christians. So, so they they are more kind of Western educated, right? Believing a theory of evolution and there was no God and all that. And so they were okay, they were okay with it. But now. When it's their turn, they had no one to protect them.、Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no nothing there for them to kind of to take a shelter. So they just being persecuted for their liberal ideas. I, I think it's worth pointing out as you're bringing up these various things that democracy itself does not mean. Civil liberties. It doesn't、right. mean human rights.、Right. Democracy just means that we are going to exercise power under this notion that the will of the people becomes manifest in government through voting.、Right. Where you can see, there's all kinds of totalitarian dictatorships around the world that insert the word democracy or republic into their words. The DPRK right. or right. yeah, you know, all all these ones. They'll say democracy, but that does not mean that there's a concept of human rights or that、no. there's any constraint on the government. And even as we talk. About China eventually adopting capitalism as part of their economic machinery, that does not mean that they have the civil liberties that we may understand are inherent、no. to capitalism、yeah. in in Western civilization. Yeah, their their logic is a kind of a twisted because they they say that the the Chinese Communist Party represent the majorities of Chinese people, so therefore. Democracy means the majority rule, and we are representing the majority. So therefore, we rule. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Well, and that's the thing where I guess, you know, in America, we like to say, you know, democracy is three wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner. Right. And while, you know, we have a constitutional republic in which the Constitution prescribes limitations on what the government can do. And that's where those civil liberties that pre-exist the government are restrain what the government can do. And and there's a very important distinction to be made there. So right. like when you say the communists go into power, they immediately start removing some of the church and the longstanding religious and cultural traditions in China. You know, they're they're violating civil liberties there. And maybe right. the intellectuals, the atheists, they're like, ah, you know, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Confucian. Right, right. I don't really practice Confucianism. So that's fine. But then as soon as the state then uses that same power to purge them, if they speak out against them, then you're seeing the repercussions of right. that. Exactly. So while we're, while we're addressing this, let's go back and finish this moment about Mao, because this idea that Mao gets where he's got a legacy, he's transformed the landscape politically of China, but Russia has shown that Stalin got kind of stabbed in the back after he after he died by this Khrushchev. And that started to insert a degree of paranoia into how Mao perceived the political landscape. Right, and let's right. take a look at that. Yeah. Mao sensed a threat when Khrushchev knocked Stalin off his pedestal, exposing his crimes. Moscow and Beijing soon drifted apart. Under Khrushchev's leadership, the Soviet Union strove to lead the world economy, even hoping to reap material gains for its own populace. Mao, for his part, wanted China to be the avant-garde of the global revolution and to change the face of the earth. Khrushchev had dethroned Stalin and destroyed his historical image. Could he, Mao, one day face a similar fate? Mao's prestige had suffered serious damage from the catastrophe of the Great Leap. He was afraid that he too might end up on the political scrap heap. He just could not conceive how such a thing could happen in the Soviet Union. And he was afraid that he might suffer a similar fate after his own death. Might there then be a Khrushchev in China? To prevent this happening, he accused Li Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping of being the Chinese Khrushchevs. This all goes to show a deep-seated complex, Mao's hatred for Khrushchev. Okay, so let's, let's, they've introduced now something that we need to understand, and that is the Great Leap Forward. They mentioned that after Stalin died, Khrushchev was ambitious in his desire to transform how Russia, where its standing was on the world stage. Russia had started their own collectivization, their own five-year plan series. And one thing that you'll notice is a lot of the things that happen in China happen a few years earlier in Russia. And Mao ends up actually adopting some of the same names. Oh, yeah. So you'll hear things like five-year plan, even right. Red Guard. When you look in the history of China, Red Guard was a phenomenon that occurred in Russia in their revolution. And it has some of the same fingerprints that the way that it was implemented in China. So Russia says that we're going to have a bigger footprint economically in the realm of industrialization than right. America. China says, well, we're going to do better than Britain. Britain was, you know, yeah. in the ascendant at that time. And so he goes into doing kind of the same thing where now that the state has power, they are going to tell you what to do. So okay. when the communists took over, China was pretty much an agricultural society. There were landlords who mm -hmm. owned larger plots of land and, you know, people would rent smaller plots of land on there. There was a lot of resentment. Some of the landlords, certainly probably a lot of the landlords were corrupt and took advantage of their power. Mm -hmm. When the communists came in, they said, you guys can take that land from your landlords. And we see some premonition of what we're going to see in struggle sessions in the Cultural Revolution by the way that the landlords are drug out in front of all of the people. They are denounced. They are told that they're in alignment with old capitalist bourgeoisie ways and their deeds are burned up and the land is distributed to the peasants. The communists' biggest asset was the support of the peasants, which they won by helping them to overthrow their oppressors, the landlords. <laughs> You 
，就是老百老百姓起来解放。In reality, as in the revolutionary operas, the landlords are dispossessed, their deeds of ownership burnt, their fields given to the tillers. And we use the word peasants not as a pejorative, but just to say the people who were the the active farmers in this ag agricultural landscape at the time. Yeah. And then when the communists first come into power, that's in the 1949, early 1950s, and now that Mao wants to reshape. How China stands in the world economy and industrialize. You know, there's a, a bunch of inputs into creating these large city centers that may have large industrial complexes. They're importing a lot of heavy machinery from Russia,、right. mm -hmm. and they've got to support and feed these city centers. And grain is the key to it all. And so his solution involves collectivization, which is that now since the state had the power to support the peasants in destroying the deeds. And taking land from the landlords, the state now has the power to take all that land from the peasants and say, "Now this is all communal property. You don't have any private property.、Right. We will set up cafeterias. You get your food from the state. You go out and you farm. It removes the profit incentive now, so people can't do anything. They can't work harder and save for themselves. They have to work, give it over to the state, and then the state gives them back、uh, right. food in the form of the the." The communal cafeterias. It can sound like crazy to, especially to Americans, but that's、mm -hmm. one of the core talents of communism. I mean, that's、uh, that's why they call communism because、right. these that, communes, right? I mean, that's that because they do truly believe that that way they can, you know, to build a lot more wealth for the common people, right? For the right. community, right? And so they they truly believe that you you instead of some、uh, landlords、um, to help me. Have their private property. They wanted the government to control everything. So one of、yeah. the challenges in communism is that is to abolish private properties. Yeah.、Uh, so this is just basically the Soviet Union practiced on that, and it was disastrous. And the Mao practiced that, and that was disastrous. Yeah. So let's let's watch the next segment now, which is about the Great Leap Forward, which was the slogan of this political campaign of Mao to try to、uh, bring China out of the agricultural age into the industrial age. Only on one occasion in 1958 did Mao let himself be tempted into economic competition with the West, so as not to leave the field to the Soviet Union alone. In the Great Leap Forward, even the villages were roped into steel production in a scheme designed to outstrip British production within the space of a few years. The more the party got itself caught up in a frenzy of successful statistics, the faster the situation in the countryside was approaching catastrophe. It wasn't steel or iron that they were producing; it was scrap. The products of their labor were simply not suitable for processing. The village foundries led to no significant improvement in the technological capabilities of the communes. In fact, they actually destroyed it. The industrial catastrophe went hand in hand with two failed harvests that drove China to the verge of ruin. Over 20 million people died of starvation as a result of the so-called Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward was the only campaign up to that point that Mao personally directed. The campaign failed miserably, and the consequences were dire. It has taken me a decade to work out the number of people who died of starvation. According to my estimates, it was somewhere between 20 and 30 million. The worst thing we ever experienced was the effect of the Great Famine in the early 60s. There were about 200 people in our village, and at least half of them starved to death in that famine. That covered the steel production part of it, because in addition to having centers of industrialized. Steel plants. He also said, if we have all of our villages have their own steel furnaces and take any raw materials they can, melt it down and send it to our large centers, then we can produce 
such enormous production in our steel output that will overwhelm the West. But it turned out that that was not the case. It was an example of a failure of central planning where government bureaucrats think that they can direct the economy and direct industry by only having a limited knowledge of all the inputs that go into it. And it was a massive failure because all of those people that diverted their resources, their time and energy from farming into that steel production contributed to the famine. But at right. the same time, it was amplified because the propaganda from the government continued to claim that it was a success. When they uh, said uh, trying to find the, the whatever raw material they can, they can get, mm -hmm. they basically just uh, confiscate people's like pots and, yeah. you know, what I mean anything like uh, iron or something, they just kind of. <laughs> Recycled. They assumed if it was metal, we can melt it down and send it, but it ended up being slag that was not useful for anything that they actually would have used it for. Right. And also the local, the people who is running the local communes or local villages, they exaggerate because they were afraid that if they tell the truth, they will be, they'll be accountable. held accountable, you know, yeah. <laughs> if, if they don't meet their quotas. And so they've got to surpass the quota. And if you're reporting and the guy before you reported that he surpassed his quota by 50%, then you've got to surpass it by more. There's yeah. this competition to be the most successful. So yeah, effect along with the propaganda, I think is really important to understand. So there's an example here of what the propaganda was at the mm. time. Let's take a listen. The rural district of Xinyang, 500 miles south of Beijing, was chosen as a national model. In 1958, more than a million officials from every part of the country visited the area. This propaganda film from the time extolled the district's achievements, showing the exemplary benefits the commune system could bring if enforced with proper zeal. Its glowing images were given the lie by the reality that lay behind. Officially, there are record harvests, grain in abundance. Communal kitchens supply the peasants every want. In real life, there is nothing. No pictures of the famine exist, not even a single photograph. None was ever taken. It remained a deathly secret, masked by images of plenty. Mao knew that if the truth got out, Beijing's enemies would gloat over the suffering his policies had caused. In Xinyang, the model district, a million people, one in eight of the population, starved to death. In 1960, three senior government officials made a detailed analysis of the population figures. All right. So that was just an example of the propaganda. And I think to give a little bit more color and depiction of the dire straits that people were in, in the midst of all this, where the one researcher that was talking told of accounts of cannibalism, right. where people even just to survive, ate their own children. And, and that may, it may not be that they killed their child to eight, but it may be that it was estimated that something like half of the tens of millions of people that died were under the age of 10, children dying of starvation. And if your child died and your family was hungry, then that was potential food for you. And, and when people are faced by starvation for which they have no other options, dire things happen. And we saw it in Russia and it was just reproducing itself here in China. And, and the, the thing is, it's totally unnecessary. It's because just Mao wants to save his face. So yes. 
And he actually refused aids from the international community. I know the Canadian government and U.S. government all said, we can give you food. We know you guys have starvation, but the, the Chinese government said, no, 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 no. All right. And there were examples even of China donating food to other countries just oh, yeah. to prove their excess. Yeah. And the things that you were mentioning before about officials falsely reporting their statistics, you know, these communes are organized and each of them has a party member that's in charge of both making sure that the quotas get met, that people go out and work and then reporting those numbers up. And those people have managers who have managers and across the entire country, people were falsely representing what it was because nobody wanted to admit Right. That the system was not working because then they themselves might be subject to political purging, right. to imprisonment. Right. And also every level can exaggerate the, the figure. So mm -hmm. you can think, go through all the levels, like you're talking about like probably 10, 10 times or 100 times what actually was really producing. Yeah. Yeah. And that whole thing where you're in the system, you're one of the leaders of the system and your, your mind is completely shaped by the ideology and you believe it's going to work. People under you are telling you data and figures. Right. And so when they talk about these three officials three. that produced right. a report and that report eventually made it not to Mao, but to uh, Zhou Enlai and uh, Deng Xiaoping, and they saw it, but they said, we need to suppress this information. And then it was the head of state, I think, who eventually went out to the countryside and was like, what's going on? Other Chinese leaders, even the head of state, Liu Xiaoqi, were never given the full picture. Liu seems not to have realized how bad things really were till a year later when he visited his home village in Hunan and talked to the peasants there. <laughs> Well,父亲到农村的时候呢,人家说这个主要都是旱灾造成的。我父亲说我是从农村长大的。说这个在旱灾的时候呢,这个池塘里呢没有水。说现在这个池塘里呢有一半的水。所以呢,是有一些灾
Now, when historians describe that apology, they describe it as a self-criticism. And they usually say that there's a longstanding Chinese cultural tradition of self-criticism. Is that something that you're familiar with or that you can explain somewhat? Well, in the Chinese history, like uh, when something like this happens, the emperor normally will admit uh, his fault. He's basically mm -hmm. self-criticized. Uh, him and uh, asking for forgiveness from the heaven. Yeah, so it definitely had that okay. tradition. Because I, I I get the sense when you read about that longstanding tradition, how even party members themselves, up until this point, Mao had forced a lot of his underlings to perform self-criticisms when they failed or when the blame for a program could be pinned on an underling, then he would have the underling stand up and give a self-criticism and, and humiliate themselves in front of the entire you know party apparatus. And this is the first time that Mao himself was compelled to do that. At that time, he was head of the state and chairman of the party itself, right. and he stepped down or was placed down in the second row or the second seat, and he maintained his role as the chairman of the party, right. but he was no longer head of state. Because the, it was a one party, one party state, but there was a division there between the party hierarchy and the state art hierarchy. Yeah, he, he was giving an honorable position, but no, no power. Right. And so that 1958 is when the Great Leap Forward starts. Over the next three years or so, there's just massive famine, tens of millions of death. I think it's 1962 or so when Mao has to perform his self-criticism, when a bit of this information, they're still not open to the world about the degree of the tragedy because of what it would mean for their whole entire ideological project. Right. But it now puts Mao on the defensive because right. now the people who were his underlings who are now taking that center stage have a reason to point to him and say these problems are because of him and that would then serve a justification because yes this famine is happening how do we get out of it if this communal system of the Great Leap Forward is the problem, then we've got to reverse it. We've got to go back to some of the pre-existing structures that allowed our country to right. generate the grain well, that was necessary. Mao is now kind of relegated to the countryside. He kind of takes a tour by right. train of the nation, right. and he starts to see that the, the new people who have taken over have started to undo his communist paradigm. And then started to say, okay, now farmers can own a little bit of land. Right. They can keep some of their own grain right. and markets can come back in where people are able to set prices. Right, right. People are able to sell their labor, all right. of these different things that are much more capitalist, definitely not communist, socialist. Right. And he just sees that as backtracking. And not only that, but these people who have taken over, who used to be his second in command, are undoing some of his project. And he's starting to say, wait a second, there's some parallels here with how Khrushchev was undoing and basically dragged Stalin and blamed all of the failures on Stalin. And this is now motivation for him to find some way to return to power and to try to recapture that position where he can shape the right. nation according to his ideology. Right.